begin with a quick recap of what we did last week, which was assigning variables. That was the main purpose of last week's workshop. And as you can see, I've given you about five, six different variables in this initial box that we're going to be playing with today. So I'm not going to make you type them out yourselves because you did that last week, hopefully, and you're good at that. But just to sort of recap, we have strings, which can be anything from a single character to a sentence, to a paragraph, to a page of text and numbers. So my string is equal to quotation marks, a string quotation marks. My name is also a string, but a much shorter one in quotation marks. A bool can be either true or false. A bool can be either true or false, or zero or one. Now you'll notice I haven't cast these. I haven't put the string or the int around it as I did last time. It's not, strictly speaking, necessary, and just for speed and convenience sake, we're using simple variables, so we'll let Python decide what they are. Int, 7, and float, which is a decimal point, 3.14. We also did learn how to do lists. So a list is in square brackets with different variables separated by commas. And for those just joining us, if you go to that link there, it'll take you to this website. And print was the basic command, the basic function we learned last week, which was to display your different variables. So if you could all run this box so we can assign these variables and make sure everything's working. And it should print a selection of variables. Is that working for everyone? Okay. So the first thing that you're probably going to want to do before you start playing with strings and playing with your various text files is you're going to want to quantify them in some way. You're going to want to know how much text you have. So one way you can do this is to use the len or the length function. Now the length function is just len and then brackets. And inside the brackets you put a variable name. Now this works for strings as well as for lists. And what it'll tell you is how many items are in that container. So if it's a string, it'll tell you how many characters are in that string. And if it's a list, it'll tell you how many items are in that list. So, what you can do right here, and I've already done it for you, I really didn't need to, <laughs> is to type in len my name or len my string and get the value of what that string is. You could also do len my list in order to get the number of items that are in the list. Okay. So that's pretty easy. It wasn't meant to be a particularly complicated task. But what that number represents is that there are 13 letters and a space, so 12 letters and a space in my name. And what you need to think of strings is strings are not just one big thing. They are actually containers, just like lists. So it's not one unit that is a word or a sentence. What it is, is a box containing lots and lots of letters. So think of it as one of those machine-readable forms you have to fill out when you go through immigration or when you're signing up for a grant or a new job, where every single one of your letters is in its own box, its own container. So my name, Melody Beals, is M-E-L in all of the boxes. So let's say you don't want to print the entire thing. You only want to print part of it. Well, you can do that by using something called index number. And what index numbers allow you to do is to use the variable and then put in brackets which character or which item in that container you want to display. And you can do that the same way we did the strings last time, where you can do a single one, or you can use the plus sign to add lots of them together. So, for example, here I have my initials, so I've created a new variable, and I've assigned it to full name character 1, 0, and full name character 8. And obviously the variable is called my name, not full name. And what this means is that the 0th character and the 8th character should be displayed. Now in Python, like in most programming languages, you start with 0 when you're counting, as opposed to starting with 1. So in this case, 0, m, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 is a space. So it really should be nine. So go ahead and do this yourself. Reassign my name, so my name equals, and put your own name in a string, and then see if you can print your own initials 
by choosing the specific letters that you want. And I'm going to come around and help you all with this. The next thing that you want to do is if you want to print several consecutive characters, it can be quite annoying to say print one, two, three, four. So you can use a bit of shorthand to get a set of letters or a set of items within your list. And basically, instead of doing variable name zero or variable name three, you use this little expression A colon B, where A is the first character that you want, colon, and B is not the second character you want. It's actually the one after the last one you want. So basically think of it as the first one of the bit you snipped off the end. So for example, if I wanted just melody, I would do zero, colon, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yes? Seven I don't want, so I would just snip that off. So I would do zero, two, seven, and that would give me just melody to print. So go ahead. Um, you can also do other things as well. If you leave the first one blank, so if you don't put in an A, and you just start it with a colon, that basically says start from the beginning. If you don't put in a B, and you just put the colon in, it says go to the end. And if you use negative numbers, it counts backwards. So for example, if I only wanted my last name, I would do negative five colon nothing. So it would go back five characters, B-E-A-L-S, and then go to the end. So go ahead and try out some variations of your name. Try doing maybe just the first character, the first three characters, the last four characters, and see how you get on. So just for those of you who haven't quite got it yet, I'll give you an example here. Print my name, brackets, um, zero through seven. And there's my name, and if I want to go by what my nephew calls me, just go by that. So, it's a pretty simple way of pulling out exactly the letters that you want if you want to just show part of them. Now, what I would like for you to do at this point is to Think about how to work with longer strings. Now, if you're working with just your name, you probably only have 12, 14, maybe 20 characters if you've got quite a long name. You can sort of deal with that. You can count the characters out. But that's not going to be really helpful in your research when you're dealing with very large text. You want to be able to work in more manageable chunks. So now we're going to talk about how to do things on a word-by-word -word basis rather than a character-by-character -character basis. Now the easiest way to do this is to use a list, because all of those functions you just learned work just as well on lists. Bring up the first word, bring up the last five words of that list. But how do we go from a string, which is a bunch of characters, to a list of a bunch of words? Well, we have to tokenize that. Now I'm going to explain that for the purposes of today, we're doing everything the long and the hard way. And the reason I'm doing that is so you understand the processes of the programming language is using so that you can develop really specific programs for your own use later on. There are libraries, which I'll show you later on this semester, which will do this a little bit faster and with less effort, but I want you to understand the process now so that you can understand the thinking behind it. So what you need to do is to use a function called split, which is nice and easy to remember. And the way you do this is you can either print or you can create a variable, and I would suggest you create a new variable which is a list. So if you create a variable, a, a new variable called my words, that's going to be a list, and equal it to my string, which is that sentence that I had you assign right at the very beginning, and then point, or full stop, split with brackets around it. It's really important that you remember to put the brackets at the end. If you don't put the brackets at the end, it won't know how to run the program. And what those brackets are actually used for later is to signify how you want to split it. So if you don't put anything in the brackets, it's going to say, okay, every time I see a white space, I'm going to split it there. I'm going to assume that's how you want me to split it. But if, for example, you had a text that you wanted to split by full stops, or by commas, or by the letter Q, 
you could put something different in those square brackets and make it split up there. So when you're here, try to separate that my string, that sentence, into a list of words, and then use the len function to tell me how many words are in that list. Does that make sense? No. So, create a new variable, basically exactly as it's written in those instructions, and this will create a new list called my words that takes my string, which is this string right up here at the top, and turns it into a list of words instead. And then you can print so you can see what my words looks like. Now that you've got a list of words, this is super useful. Because with a list of words at your disposal, you can do all sorts of analytics. You can count how many times a certain word appears. You can look for certain traits of the words. You can regularize it. So every time a word is spelled a certain way, you can count how many times it's spelled that way and then change it to a different spelling. We're not going to do all of these complicated things today, but this is a really useful tool to take a text and put it into manageable bits to do some kind of analysis on it. So now that your sentence has been tokenized, it's easier to get out of it a sublist of words. You don't have to count how many letters into the sentences now. You can just know how many words it is. So what I would like you to do is to create another new list, call it whatever you like, and I would like you to assign to that new list a subsection of that sentence. So using those index numbers that you learned how to do with the single word, Use those to pull out a certain segment of the sentence. So maybe the first three words, or the last three words, or two words in the middle. Make a subversion of that list. And print it to your screen so that you can see it. So now that we have the ability to pull out a couple of words from our list, what do we do with that subsection of our list now that we have it? So for example, um, sub list equals my words, and I want the first four. And then I print my sub list. There we go. The time has come. Good way of starting. So the time has come that you have that. Now, this is a way of separating your list. Now, later on in your project, you might say, okay, now that I have my sublist, I want to put it back into a single string. I want to have it recombined into one thing. And the way you do that is you use a different function called join. Now, this is pretty intuitive, I hope. You split it up into lots of words and you join it back together into one string. Join has a slightly weird way of writing it, so I'm going to try to explain it quite simply. Join is two speech marks, and in between that speech mark, you put some character. And what that character represents is what you're going to be joining in between your items. So in most cases, you're just going to want a space. But you might want to put an underscore, or you might want to put a hyphen, depending on what type of project you're doing. So for example, it's going to be the space, time space, has space, come. That's what the joining thing is. After that, you do full stop, join, and in brackets, and that is the name of the function. That's the little program we're running to join it. And inside the brackets, you put the name of your list or your sublist. And I'm just going to print this whole thing so that you can see what it looks like when it's joined back up together. So, in speech marks, what you want in between the items of your list, a full stop and the command join, and in the brackets of the command, the name of the list that you're joining up together. So go ahead and see if you can staple your list back together, either with spaces or underscores or hyphens or squiggly lines, whatever you like. You now have the ability to take a text, to chop it up into little bits, take out the bits you want, staple it back together, and present it.
it. That's actually a lot. That is something that you really should be quite proud of that you're able to do now in a lot of different ways. And you're doing it manually at the moment. You're saying, I want word four to word seven, and that seems a bit silly. You could just copy and paste it if you were using this document. But think about it computationally for a moment. Perhaps you want to know what the third word of every sentence is. You could look for full stops, count three words, and then print a list of what the third word of every sentence is. And then you can analyze that. What we're going to do now is going to give you a taste of what you can do with things computationally now that you have these ingredients to play with. So we're going to do something called a loop. Now there's lots of different loops, and loops are basically the bread and butter of programming. Loops exist in pretty much every single computer language, and they are among the most simple programmatic things that you can do. Now, I don't mean simple like you're going to be able to do it without thinking, but I mean they are the building block upon which all of their programs are built. And all a loop really is, is saying, do this so many times. That's all it means. So what I want you to kind of understand is if you're doing something really menial and really boring hundreds and hundreds of times, you shouldn't be doing that. You should write a little program and do it once and have the computer do it over and over and over for you. I found this out the hard way when I was trying to regularize some of my data. I ended up doing it about 70 times using control F. And then I went, why am I doing this? And I just wrote a little program. So every time I got a new data set, I could just say, regularize, and then it fixed all the little eccentricities in my data for me. I didn't have to keep doing it with control F for the rest of my life. So now we're going to make a very simple for loop. And a for loop has a basic format. For X in Y, do something. Pretty simple. Now the bits you have to remember about this are the X is a temporary variable. So basically it can be any word you want. And you usually write it in Python so it makes sense to you. And we'll get to that in a minute. Y is the actual variable, the variable you've already defined. So a string or a list or a number. On the, you have to put a colon because you're saying that this is going to be a, a for loop. And on the next line, you have to have an indentation, so a tab. Four spaces or the tab. I suggest you use the tab button on your computer. And then you do a function, and that function can be anything. It can be the lend function, the print function, the join function, any of these other functions that you've already learned. So let's create a really simple one. In the box below, I want you to create a for loop using this format, where you take a word from your word list and you print it. So I'll give you the first line, and hopefully you'll be able to finish it. So for word in my words, and if you put the colon, it'll automatically indent it for you, so you know you've done it correctly. If it doesn't indent it, you've forgotten the colon. So what comes next, if I want to print all, every word in my list? for every 
every bunny in my words, print bunny, and it would still work. Word is not actually telling it anything. It's just a bit of algebra, essentially. It's a placeholder. If you do write code like this and give it to somebody else, though, they will not like you. So try to write it so that it makes sense to the person who's speaking the same language as you. So I'll go through it one more time just to kind of clarify it. A for loop basically says for every condition, for every word in my list, if you had done for bunny in my string, it does every object in that container. And in a string is a container of characters. So it does every one. So for every item in my container, do something, and in this case, print it. I could have said, for example, for every word in <coughs> my words, Lynn word. So what's this going to do? Yes, it'll give me the number of characters because each word is its own little string. So if I do this, oh, I forgot to print. <laughs> print. It gives me how many letters are in every single word. And that's really fun for statistics, right? <laughs> this is very low level linguistics, I'm sure. <laughs> There's also a very um, good study that was done a few years ago where they took various authors and they just took out all the punctuation and, and showed just the punctuation. So you have like Cormac McCarthy, which is just like one full stop. And that's basically his book. And then you have other people who just have millions of different punctuation marks. And you kind of make abstract art out of that. So this is what a for loop is. A for loop is for every item in my container, do something. Now, if you notice, every single one of those is its own line. And that's because what I've essentially done is pr gone print the length of the word, print the length of the word, print the length of the word, print the length of the word. I've not had to write it out manually because I've done it as a program, but as far as the program is concerned, it's done each of those print commands on a separate line. So you get lots and lots of lines. That's really kind of difficult to deal with. So you can also make the print command behave slightly differently. If you put this extra bit of information, so print your variable name, just like you normally would, comma, end, and then some character, it will replace the end of line, the line break, with something else. So if I print um, my, so if I go here, and instead of printing the word, I print the word with a comma and a space between it, it goes back kind of to looking like a list, which seems a bit silly considering I just rejoined it as a, a sentence. But you can change it to anything. So if I want it to have semicolons, or if I want it to have a happy face, anything you want to separate this out. This is particularly useful, for example, if you want to go from a comma-separated list to a tab-separated list for if you want to do something in a spreadsheet. So those are loops. So for every item in my container, do something. Well, maybe you don't want to do it for every single item in your container. Maybe you only want to do it for some of the items in your container, if a certain condition is true, if something special has happened. So that's when you need the if statement. Loops and if statements. That's all programming is, really. <laughs> If my name is equal, and remember, one equal sign is to assign something, two equal signs is to ask if it's actually equal. So if my name is equal to Melody Beals, print my name. So I'll give you an example. At the moment, if I type this in, it works because my name is Melody Beals. But if I decide my name is now MH Beals, it doesn't work. Because the variable my name has been assigned to Melody Beals, not to MH Beals. So that's why it's no longer working. So basically it's doing the same thing that a for loop is doing, 
but it's asking a question rather than going through everything through a list. What we're going to do now is we're going to learn how to append a new item to our list. So we start by creating a new list, a blank one, with just some square brackets. Then we go through our for loop. So for every word in my words, check to see if the word starts with a T, the way we did before. And if it does, I want to create a new list appendage, a new item in my list of that word. So new list, full stop append, and in brackets, word. Now just to see if that's worked correctly, we're going to print our new list. And we're going to do that using the join function we already learned. So put in a comma as the separator, and inside put in the new list. We're printing our sublist of our words, and you end it with a full stop at the end. And as we look, yes, there we go. Now, a for loop is basically for going through everything in an object. But maybe you don't want to do that. Maybe you want to do things a certain number of times. So you want to do it 10 times, or 100 times, or until a certain counter reaches zero. That's when you use a while loop. While something is true, keep doing it. When it's no longer true, stop doing it. So an example would be a counter like this. So you create an integer called i, this is just kind of a convention, it's an iterator. It iterates over and over through your project. You can call it C for counter if that makes more sense to you, X. And we set it to zero. So we want to start the counter at zero. While I is less than 10, so as so long as I does not have a value greater than 10, do something. Print I, so print that number. After it prints that number, I've told it to add 1 to i. So i is no longer i, but i is now equal to whatever i was plus 1. So if it, i is 0, it becomes 1. If it's 1, it becomes 2. Then it goes back to the beginning of the loop. That's how a while loop works. And now it says, well, i is now 1. 1 is still less than 10, so let's do it again. 2 is less than 10. When it gets to 10, 10 is not less than 10, so it'll just stop. So go ahead and in that box, make yourself a little while loop. And you can be creative. Maybe it will just print your name 10 times. Or maybe it'll add each number to itself. So make a, a different number and say that add i to a running total. What is 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5? Go ahead and have a look, and I'll come around and help you if I can. We're going to essentially end it here, but I'm going to give you a little bit of homework for next week. Um, what I would like for you to do is to create a little program that creates a concordance. Now, a concordance is basically looking for a particular word and then showing the words that came immediately before and after it in a section. So, so for the time has come for all good men to come to the aid of their country. I asked it for the word to. And as you can see, men to come, come to the. So it found all the instances of the word to and showed me in context of three words. And I did this with four loops, rather, sorry, I did it with a list, a while loop, an if statement, the starts with, and index numbers, and print. So everything that you've learned in this lesson will allow you to create your own bit of concordance software. So that's your bit of homework for this week. Go back, have a look through this tutorial again as many times as you need to, and see if you can't create your own concordance program. If you get really stuck and you can't wait till next week to find out, there is the solution that I came up with on the separate web page, but do try to do it on your own. Thank you very much, and next week, we'll be working with larger text and running some basic statistics on that text. So you'll get a chance to do some proper research now that you have the tools to do so. Thank you very much. And for those of you who want the solution, here we go. So I create a new list, which I call concordance, and a new iterator, which I set at zero. Then I begin my while loop. So while i is less than the length of my words, so while I have words left in my list, and if the word begins with 
the letters T, O, so I'm looking essentially for the word two. Then I want to create a new substring called ingram. And I create that substring, that string, by using the join function. So I join together my words and the word before I, before the word two, all the way to the word after two, I plus two. So two words after is where I do the snipping. Then I append that new ingram, that three word selection, to my concordance list. And I do that by going through the entire iterative function, adding one to I every time. At the very end, I go through my ingrams that are in my concordance list, and I print them off one by one. And if I do this for you, you'll see that I have, in fact, created a concordance with two different entries, man to come and come to the. Thank you very much.